Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome to the Aliyah Day. Pull this over here. I'm getting my mic closer. There we go. Baruch Hashem. Glad you are here this morning. I am uh, glad to be with you. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Won't you be mine? Baruch Hashem. So yeah, Carol, I see your um, your your message there. A lot of oppression in Canada, and as I understand it, a lot of oppression in Australia over this uh, whole, you know, COVID thing. Uh, a lot of a uh, lot of uh, people being oppressed, and and freedoms being uh, uh, taken away. Bonjour, Angela. Bonjour. Welcome, Zapora. Glad you're here. May Hashem give you every ability to uh, to move to Texas. I know you'll you'll miss the beach and the water, but you know we have uh, you can pull up the beach and water on YouTube in HD and, and watch it even in 4K. It'd be like you're there, but not. Uh, so yeah, Baruch Hashem. I had another message from a, from someone in Canada just just yesterday, uh, reaching out and and going through a, a similar situation uh, as far as uh, the oppression goes there. So. Uh, praying that Hashem shall, uh, you know, release, bring some type of, you know, freedom or whatever. Uh, may God bring about a, a a great and wonderful miracle. Uh, also, um, I received a card yesterday, an anonymous card with a wonderful little blessing, and from one of our viewers in Houston. Uh, I don't know who they are, of course, uh, but I just wanted to say. Todah Ba is extraordinarily uplifting, and uh, people send us cards, and I, I thank everybody for the cards and notes that you send. People do that actually quite frequently. We receive notes and cards of encouragement. Sometimes people email encouragements or whatever, and this is a very sweet card. And so Todah Ba, we're able. I just wanted to say Todah Ba for that. And something else, uh, somebody had sent us, and I don't have the name in front of me. Um, um, some beautiful uh, paintings, uh, Israel, Israeli uh, portraits, paintings, and, and what have you. And uh, we got those a few weeks back, and um, my wife was just reminding me yesterday we need to take those down and get them framed and, and so on. And uh, we're working on that just now. And anyway, it's uh, very much appreciated. Talar Ba for that. That's very gracious and uh, they're just beautiful. And so thank you all of you for being so involved. And uh, so many people are uh, involved and, uh, you know, participate. And and it's just it's just wonderful. It's a blessing. And to Dawraba, to all of you. Also, I haven't mentioned this in a, a long time because most people are familiar with it, but we have a lot of people who are new. And by the way, if you haven't uh, subscribed to our channel, channel, please do so. Uh, we'd love to have you as a part of our uh, online community here and so on. But if you go to the, uh, hey, Shalom, Pedro, good to see you, sir. Uh, if you go to the um, the Sar Shalom Synagogue website, which is mysarshalom.com, uh, there is, under one of the headings there, there are uh, a publication we call the Shabbat Table Sparks. And I want to bring this to your attention because that's something I did a few years ago. Somebody said one time, you should do new ones every year. <laughs> uh, I would love to, but wow, it takes a lot of time. Uh, anyway, I would love to. Maybe we'll update them. But in, in any case, there, there are Shabbat table sparks for every parasha. And they're intended to be use on Friday nights to spark Torah conversations at the Arab table. Some of you have used them, you know, and but some of you are not aware of them. And so I wanted to make you aware of them so that you can take advantage of them. Uh, they include insights from the Torah portions, they commentaries, they, in, they include uh, com, uh, insights from the Talmud sometimes and and a little bit of Musar and some Hasidic stories. So en enough information there to, to kind of spark, hence the name, um, 
you know, uh, conversation. You can download them at mysarshalom.com. So, all right, so we're in Parsha Mishpatim. We're going to look at a few uh, things here. Let's begin with, with this statement. A um, couple, a couple of interesting insights here. Um, as we're looking at, this is a little, a little uh, insight that has to do with the concept of original sin as it's understood from a Jewish point of view. You know, I have read in numerous commentaries, most of them are modern commentaries. They're not, they're not to my, I'm, I'm trying to think if I'm, if I'm, if I'm thinking of any more antiquated commentaries, they're, 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 they're mostly in modern commentaries or, or, you know, web searches or something like that. You read that Jews don't believe in the concept of original sin. And I don't really understand that thought process because, and because Judaism absolutely believes in the idea of original sin. I think that the application of that is nuanced and different from the Christian idea of original sin. So let, let me, let's kind of explore the Christian idea of original sin and we're going to juxtapose it to the, to the Jewish idea of original sin. And we're going to try to discern the difference, which on the one hand is, is a big difference. And on the other hand is easily missed. It's, it's, it's because the difference are diff differences are slight. So the Christian idea is that we are all born sinners straight out of the, out of the womb and pretty much guilty of sin from day one upon which we are borned. You have to say borned. And there's that. And I think that pretty much sums it up. Because of what Adam did, sin has been, Adam's sin has been applied universally. And as a result, we are all sinners from the womb. I think that pretty much is the appropriate application from a Christian point of view. I think from a Jewish point of view, the nuance is different in that, and this is why I think on the one hand, you'll you'll read, particularly in our modern age online and and, and different web, and, it can, and by the way, it could be, I'm, I'm talking about reputable websites, reputable Jewish, Orthodox Jewish websites that, uh, well, Jews don't believe in the concept of original sin. And I kind of, when I read that from time to time, I'm like, eh, that's not really true, actually. It's not really true if you read the sources. It's kind of like you read sometimes where Jews will say, well, we don't really believe in a, a literal Satan. Like, uh, pardon me? Like, yeah, we do. And we believe in hell, too. And we believe in an eternal hell. And, and we absolutely do. Some of these things, I think, are more psychological as opposed to theological. And that happens so often. Um, because to believe in the concept of original sin seems to a lot of Jewish people to sound very Christian. And so we instantly want to reject that. We don't believe in that. We believe that everybody is, is and the reason we, we reject that is because we believe in the words of the prophet Ezekiel that talks about that every man is liable for his own sin. All right, so what's the Jewish idea? The Jewish idea is that you're born innocent. The moment you're born, the Yetzer Hara enters you. Now let's pause right there. Because... From a Jewish point of view, right, the Yetzirah and the Satan are really the same thing. 
It's the same thing. The Yetzirah, the Satan, and the Angel of Death, the Grim Reaper, are all the same thing. Okay? So, that being true, uh, if you say that a, a, a baby is born, borned, and the the Yetzirah enters them, what you're really saying is is really the spirit of the Satan enters the child in the in the form of a Yetzirah. Now I'm not saying I'm not suggesting here that, that babies are possessed by by the great demon, the great dragon. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is is that the Yetzahara is the aspect of the Satan. The Yetzahara, which uh, is the 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 you know selfish animal instinct. So Interestingly, the sages point out that the Yetzirah doesn't enter the baby while it's yet in the womb, okay? Because if it did, the Yetzirah wants what it wants even to its own detriment. It's like a parasite. A parasite will kill its host, not realizing that if you kill the host, then you no longer have a functioning environment in which you can live. But it doesn't care. It just wants what it wants. So if the Yetzirah was inside the baby's soul prior to birth, it would kick itself out of the womb. Even though that would result in its death, it doesn't matter. So it waits until the baby is born. So this is why children are, you don't, you don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a child necessarily to say no. And we all know this. It's it's common. I mean, anybody who's been around children, which is pretty much every human being, mostly, we all know that you you have to teach your children to be generous. You have to teach them to share. You have to teach them to be mannered. You have to teach them to be polite, et cetera, et cetera. You never have to teach them, hey, quit being so polite. Hey, quit being so generous with your toys. Hey, you know, remember, you don't always have to share. You know, we don't. come on. So, but having said that, and I think this is the difference, having said that, the child is not automatically from the womb guilty of sin. I think that's the difference. But looking from the Jewish point of view, there is absolutely, positively, without any shadow of a doubt, from Jewish sources, the sin of Adam affects mankind. Absolutely. Because there's a statement, and we've said this many times, there were there were four men in Jewish history, one of them being the father of David, who were thought to be completely and, and perfectly without sin, meaning they followed the will of God completely. Which, by the way, is possible, which a lot of people have been taught wrongly, and this is a very important thought process I need you to understand, regardless of what you've been mentally conditioned to believe. You you have, and I have, been mentally conditioned to believe that it is impossible, keyword, impossible for men not to be sinners. Because, like the Bible says, all men ha are, 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 have sinned and fallen short of the God, great, you know, that is a quote from the, from the letters. And, and, the Tanakh says there's none righteous, no, not one. Okay, so we take that, and this is this is where we make the theological mistake. We hear that there's no one who's not a sinner, and everyone has fallen, and there's none righteous, no, not one. And we take that, and we do this gigantic leap over to that means it's impossible, impossible being the key word, to not sin. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not true. And I've shared this concept many times over the years, and I, understandably so, run into a mental, people that are like confused. Like, wait a minute, but if it's, if it's not impossible, then how can we all be sinners? It's called, say it with me, choice. 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 Because if there isn't a choice involved, then there can be no judgment. Okay? And if there's no judgment, then there's no need of salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, there are laws on the books 
right? Talking about our our regular civil, civil, uh, our regular criminal code and so on. You aren't condemned just because there is a law. You're condemned only if you made a choice to break the law. Okay. Now, if you want to be just quite frank, as, a part, as opposed to being quite Charlie, you can make the argument that all of us, no matter where you live, no matter what where you're from, we're all lawbreakers. All right, well, not all of us have murdered, thank God. Not all of us have, you know, committed some kind of heinous crime. We're not, we don't view ourselves, I'm not a criminal. I don't, I've never, you know, hurt anybody. I've never robbed a bank. I've never, you know, whatever, uh, assaulted anyone or whatever the case is. And that's true. Most of us haven't. I haven't. But there are other laws that we have broken that we don't really think about. We have all, don't raise your hands, <laughs> but we have all broken the, the speed limit. Right. We've all done things. Some of us, well, none of you, but those other people out there have taken things before that what didn't really belong to them. Even if it was at the office. You know, there's and we could go down the list. There's a, a bunch of different things. And I'm talking about the the penal code of our societies. We've all done something that has broken the law in some way. But if you really think about it, there's not one time, and that's true, Angela said, even inadvertently, very much true, which by the way, all the sacrifices are for inadvertent sins. You know, there's not a sacrifice for an intentional sin, which is ultimately why you need the Zodic to die for you. But that's another, that's a whole nother class. In this case, when you go look, look at it that way, think about it. Think about all the times where you have broken the law, even inadvertently. It being br Breaking the law, spiritually or otherwise, inadvertently is also a choice. You made a choice to do X, not maybe not realizing that X was a violation of the law, but it doesn't matter. You still made the choice to do that. How many of you have ever been pulled over for speeding and you didn't realize that you were speeding? You didn't realize that the, the, the zone in which you were driving was a certain speed limit. When you told the police officer, you know, it's 30 miles an hour here. I, I had no idea. He didn't go, oh, you didn't know? No, I didn't know. Oh, well, I, I'm sorry for pulling you over. Since you didn't know, you know what? I'm sorry to waste your time. Uh, please, by all means, leave. You didn't know? That's all well and good. No. Sometimes you get a speeding ticket. Sometimes you get a warning. But don't be surprised if you get a speeding ticket. You can say, well, I didn't know. Eh? And why? Actually, I've, I've read Jewish commentaries about this. It's our job to know. Ignorance is not bliss. You could say, well, that's not fair because how could, you know, the speed limit. And I totally get it. We, there's all kinds of arguments. But ultimately, the way the law views it is it's our responsibility as citizens to know the law. If we're going to drive on the street, whatever street it is, to use this example, it's our responsibility to know what the speed limits are the entire route that we're driving. You can say, well, that's not practical. It doesn't matter. It's still our responsibility. This takes me back to the core where people miss it. And that is every law that you and I have broken, even inadvertently, we have to understand it was our choice. We chose to break the speed limit. No one made us. No one's in the passenger seat holding a gun to our temple saying, I told you to drive 70 and a 30. Do it. Do it now. No one's doing that. No one told you to steal the, the calculator from the office. Right? So when it comes down, what, the, what therefore is the sin of Adam? So, so these four people, but they didn't commit a sin. 
However, they ended up dying anyway. So the sages say the only reason they died was, quote, for the sin of Adam. So the sin of Adam does affect us in two primary ways. Number one, it affects us with the Yetzirah. It brings it, the sin of Adam allows the Yetzirah to come into our life. And it's the Yetzirah that ultimately talks us into sin. Still a choice. Still a choice. The devil made me do it is not going to be a, a good defense uh, in front of the heavenly court. And the second thing that the sin of Adam does for us is it brings death. But there is absolutely, as the sages often point, point to it, there is a there is the poison that pulses through our veins of, of the serpent, which is why we are trapped, so to speak. If you're born of a, if you have a, if you, if I'm talking to you today and, and you have both a human father and a human mother, and I think that's going to apply to pretty much everybody I'm talking to. There might be a few out there that don't have both a human father or at least you think you were born with an immaculate conception. <laughs> but if you have both a human father and a human mother, you, like I, like me, my, I, me, like me, we are trapped inside the klipa of the sin of Adam because we are subject to death. This is why the Messiah is divine, must have been divine, cannot be anything other than divine. He cannot be a mere human because he cannot be trapped like us. The sin of Adam cannot be, if you will, upon the Mashiach. Otherwise, he can't rescue us, which is why he had to be born, borned the way he was borned. So, all of that to come back to this idea. With guile, it says the same term is used to describe the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Ve hanachash. By the way, the word for serpent is nachash, which in interestingly has the same gematria as Mashiach. So the Mashiach is likened to the serpent which is why there was a serpent on the pole that Moshe lifted up. And anybody who looked at the serpent would be instantly healed. So this is why Mashiach said, if I be lifted up, then I'll draw all men to me. So the Mashiach had to be a put on the pole, crucified, and lifted up so that we would look upon him and be healed. And he, the Mashiach became a serpent in order to undo the sin of the serpent in our life. This is why it says in the apostolic letters, he who knew no sin became sin, became the serpent, so that so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is this is and this is how God works in our life. And this is why, you know, we I've talked many, many times because of personal experience that sometimes our worst sins and our greatest failures can become if if we make true of course teshuva out of love of god that that's we got to make true teshuva that's that's critical it can't, can't be fake teshuva you got to make true teshuva out of love of god not because of any other reasons other than you love god and your 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 you regret what happened because of what it did to the kingdom of god but those things those great sins can become great great uh uh platforms of 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 healing and, and restoration and and great works. And so the reason is, is because there's some type of, uh, there is a supernatural, I should say, phenomenon that Hashem is able to work in our life where the serpent can become the element of healing. So the serpent that we brought through our sin becomes that element of healing. And only God can do that. So it goes on to say, okay, so it says, now the serpent was cunning beyond any beast of the field. It says, this craftiness was at the origin 
of the first sin. So once again, Judaism does believe in, in an original sin. Absolutely it does. It's just nuanced a little differently. Okay. From the and, and again, not to be repetitive at the or at the risk of being repetitive, Christianity believes that hey, we just don't have a choice in the matter. We're just automatically born sinners. It's impossible to not be a sinner. And so there you go. And this is why it's so easy to completely disregard the Torah because hey. God gave me a bunch of laws I can't keep. And so this is why he was able to dispense with them because it was really just a big, it was a 2,500 year demonstration to mankind that, hey, you can't do this. Ha ha, the joke's on you. I gave you a bunch of laws you cannot do. And wink, wink, nod, nod. Yeah, it was all to show you that you can't do it and you ultimately need a savior. That's the Christian message. And that was just spoken to me not that long ago by somebody who basically was saying the same thing. To wit, I retorted and said, well, that's extraordinarily, what's the word? Cruel and what? Unjust. Because if God gives us a law we cannot keep, we, it's impossible for us to keep. No one can do it. If that were really true, which it's not, because the Bible, and funny, fu funny, the Bible actually says the, the exact opposite of what I just said. The Bible actually says it's not too hard to keep. But if it were, how could we be held accountable for that? In what universe would it be just for a judge to send us to hell for doing something we couldn't help but do? That'd be like a local authority saying, I need you to not breathe. And you're like, okay. And then when a few seconds, you got to take a breath. Oh, oh, you're going to prison for the rest of your life. For what? For breathing. That's not justice. And that's not God. And it's certainly not a God of love. However, when we approach it from the rational, logical, let's take personal responsibility for our actions point of view, and we say, actually, it was my choice. You know, here's another example. There are 613 commandments. Now, not all the commandments are uh, for everybody, because some commandments are for women, some commandments are for um men some are for priests some have to do with sacrifices and we can't do sacrifices on today only because there's not a temple okay but let's just suppose for the sake of argument let's suppose that there was a temple or there is a temple may be rebuilt and speedy in our in our time i want to offer you a pepsi challenge okay find one commandment just one out of the 613 just one that you can honestly to say, Rabbi, I cannot do this one. Like I just, whew. like I, it's physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually impossible for me to keep this commandment. It's interesting because I've had lots of people tell me, well, what about the one uh, about this purity or that purity? And they talk about it from the standpoint of, it's challenging. It would require them to be more thoughtful and, and, and basically change their routine, right? Change their lifestyle. And I look at them like, oh, is that impossible? Or is it just inconvenient? Ah. See, what happens is in theology, we, we, we elevate our inconvenience to the status of impossibility. Well, if it causes me to change my routine, then it's impossible. I'm sorry. Is that really true? The reality is now you can make the effort and I encourage you to go ahead and make the effort. Let me go ahead and save you some time, though, and tell you that there isn't one of the 613 commandments that you cannot do, not one. Not even lying. You say, well, Rabbi, everybody lies. You're right. We do, unfortunately, and it's a choice. It's not because you can't help it. You're not born a liar. 
which by the way, this is why you can't be born having perverted thoughts about the same sex or whatever, because God is not going to cause anybody to be born a sinner. You're not born a sinner. You're born with a righteous soul. You're well, well, to be more correct, you're born a righteous soul. The Yetzirah tempts you to make choices to sin. And as a result, we're sinners, but it's only because of our choice. Any God that would send us to hell for doing something we couldn't help but doing is not a just deity. Nor is it a loving deity. It's actually rather a sadistic deity, actually. And that's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gives us choices. And now if you think about it, how do we fix a sin? To illustrate my point even further, everybody pretty much knows that if we are sinners, then the way to rectify that is we have to make teshuva, repent. What does that mean? It means we have to make a choice to stop sinning and turn back to God. Everybody knows that. That's pretty, pretty academic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that further illustrates the point. Because if the remedy to not being a sinner anymore is to make a choice to turn to God, then it must have been our choice to turn away from God. It's so simple. The problem is when people say it's impossible, I couldn't help but do it. It was, I, I couldn't help but break God's law. That's where we get all messed up. And it skews, and it's so important, that little nuance, because it skews everything, because people are so able at that point to totally ignore the law of Moses because they've been taught erroneously their whole life. They couldn't help but break it. So why even bother going back to it? I can't, that's not true. You made a choice. If you robbed a bank because you were desperately poor, then you made a choice to rob the bank. And if you want to change your life, you have to make a choice to no longer do those kind of things. Incidentally, there is a misnomer um, that people that steal do so because they're just poor. They need bread. So our daughter Hadassah had the opportunity to do a, um, a, uh, a special event with the United States Navy sea cadets in which she was able to go downtown and spend some time at the DA's office talking with district attorneys and so on. And one of the DA's that she was talking to assistant DA's has to do with, uh, uh, what do you call it? White collar crime, like embezzlement and, you know, identity theft and stealing and so on. So what the, uh, the assistant DA was telling her was that these people that, you know, they still credit cards, they still, they still bank accounts. Some of it's big time crime. Like, you know, most of it is, is big time crime. A hundred thousand dollars, 200,000, 600,000, whatever million. He said, in all of his years, what he finds so fascinating is that these people don't use this money to get ahead in life. They're not using the money to pay off mortgages. They're not using the money to pay off credit cards. They're not using the money to pay off cars. They're just frivolously spending this money on all types of extravagant things. None of them, in all the years he's been doing this, actually use the money. For anything positive, like I, I stole the $600,000 from this person's bank account fraudulently, and I used that money to pay for my daughter's surgery she's been needing. No. At the end of the day, he said what's what's fascinating is at the end of the day, these people who have stole, stolen excuse me, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, they're still in debt. They still have lots of debt in their life. And I just wanted to share that with you because 
uh, there's a misnomer that people and we just in fact, in fact, Rebetzin and I were just. I just realized this was part of Rabbi Tversky's um, uh, insights this morning. The Rebetzin and I were she was just reading to me the insights and and he talked about how how we justify our disobedience to God's word and we and we say well I've got to do this because I've got to do this because I've got to I've got to save my child you know and so on you know my 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 son needs uh whatever he needs a major medical work and if I rob the bank I could that's not why people rob banks they don't rob banks to pay off their mortgage they rob banks to spend the money waste the money on frivolous stuff and that, ladies and gentlemen, illustrates our human condition of why we break God's law. We don't break God's law because we have to. We break God's law because we're trying to fulfill some selfish desire. That's the thing. That's right, Rebbe said. He said they use the money to buy extravagant homes, yachts, take extravagant trips around the world, go to Europe and stuff like that. And then meanwhile, they don't they don't pay off any other day. It's just fast, it's a fascinating point. So one more thing here, one more insight, then we'll close it out because we're we're over time anyway. But uh it says you, you you shall do this from my altar. The altar does not grant any special protection to the criminal. Okay. This is talking about uh Offering up a sacrifice for a violation. Okay. The law of the Torah does not permit two principles such as religion and state or justice and mercy to balance or check one another. The Sanhedrin was located right near the altar and the principles consecrated by the one did not differ at all from the other or differ, excuse me, from all at all from the other. After the death penalty is pronounced, justice must be carried out. Now, listen to this. This is very important because now this gets into a discussion of the generosity, the merciful attitude of the Jewish court. And a lot of people, again, we I, I don't have time to, to wax eloquently about this, but most people view Jewish, Jewish courts, law of Moses, as very hard and harsh and, you know, mean but this is talking about somebody who, because of their sin, they have been sentenced to death, which, by the way, was an extraordinarily difficult thing to achieve in a Jewish court. To be actually sentenced to death in a legitimate Jewish court was, first of all, could only be done by at least a Sanhedrin Kantan, which means 21 judges. And for certain individuals who are like leaders of the community and prophets and so on, they require 71 judges, 71. So to even to be, even to be pronounced worthy of death, you have to have at least 21 judges. Anyway, the point is, is it was very rare, very rare for somebody to actually get the death penalty. There's all kinds of due processes and safeguards. Why? Why? Why is this the case? Why, Rabbi? Because the Judy, the, the, the Talmud brings down that the, the goal of the Sanhedrin was not to kill people for violating Torah. The goal of the Sanhedrin was tr to try to redeem people, to try to find a way, if they had violated the Torah and something that was worthy of death, to find a way to help them make teshuva so that they could live and not die and declare the glory of God. How do you declare the glory of God? By now being a Torah observant righteous Jew. We're not here to kill you. This is, And the reason for this is because of what Ezekiel said, when God said through Ezekiel, I don't, I don't enjoy the death of sinners. I'd rather you repent and live. So the Sanhedrin took that spirit and said, you know, we're only going to condemn you to death if it's like radically, radically necessary. Now, some of you are probably wondering about Yeshua's and that whole thing, but that was a kangaroo court. Well, I've talked about that before, but let's go on. So it says here, um, after the death penalty is pronounced, justice must be carried out. If the law ordains death for the criminal, the execution of the verdict is not cruel. Listen to this. But like a sacrifice, it becomes atonement for him the society, and the land. Even if the only 
if if the only qualified Cohen was charged with homicide, we are duty bound to restrain him from the altar and bring him to the court of justice. Now, did you point kick point that out? Did you catch that rather? That in the case of someone who's condemned to death, it's not to be carried out cru like a cruel measure, but rather it's like a sacrifice. It becomes atonement for the criminal, and it becomes atonement for the society, and it becomes atonement even for the land. So someone who's condemned to death, Judaism doesn't look like, oh, you're a you're a you're condemned to death. We're gonna make sure your death is cruel. No, they understand that death for the individual and even for the community can be a source of atonement, which brings up a whole interesting dialogue about or monologue, I should say, about the death of Messiah Yeshua and how that was a cosmic atonement. Anyway, that's all for today. It's a lot. I hope it was insightful. God bless all of you. Be sure and subscribe to our channel. I also, by the way, be sure and don't forget your contrib contributions, financial contributions and donations to our ministry. There's ways to give. You can find that in the uh, description of this um, this video, or you can call the office here and contribute that way. But we rely upon your financial support. And many of you are, many of you are very uh, gracious and generous and you are faithful. And some of you haven't had that opportunity or taken that opportunity to do so. And I'm asking you for your generous support as well. If you enjoy this program and you enjoy what's being taught here, then please uh, join with us financially and help us to keep it going. So God bless all of you. Thank you so much for being with us. May you have a beautiful and wonderful day. We will look forward to, with God's help, seeing you manana. Shalom Aleichem.